All right, and now for the seventh one, we have that Leo is investigating whether a six-sided die is fair. So whether a six-sided die is fair. He rolls the die 60 times and records the observed frequencies in the following table. So here we have a number in the die and the observed frequency. What does that mean? So he threw this 60 times. See? Of the 60 times, the amount of times he got a 1 on the die was 8. The amount of times he got a 2 on the die was 7. The amount of times he got a 5 on the die was 12. Okay, so those are observed frequencies, not expected. We have that Leo carries out a chi-squared goodness of fit test at a 5% significance level. For part A, we need to write down the null and an alternative hypothesis. And so for part A, okay, this all really depends on how you set up uh, your approach. See? Um, but what it will revolve around is what your guy is trying to investigate. And so Leo is investigating whether the six-sided die is fair. So fair means that it's honest, you know, it's not like it's some bullshit die that's like charged to one side or the other. We might, for example, figure out that it is a charged die because we only got six times number three. And you would expect number three to show up a lot more. And so is it fair? That's the question. Or was it just a game of chance and, you know, it's, you know, maybe it is fair, maybe it's not. Like, we got to figure it out. See, this could have been a... This could have been within the realm of possibilities, or it could be bullshit and it's not fair. See? So that is the sort of thing we will find out. All right, so for part A, write down the null and alternative hypotheses. And so basically for your null, okay, and your alternative, one of them is like, what I'm investigating is true. And the other one is like, what I'm investigating is not true. Okay? It's very important that for your null hypotheses, you will write hypothesis you will write it on H0, okay? That is like the technical way to put it. And so for H0 in this case, I will put that the die is fair. Okay, your alternative hypothesis, again, following its name alternative, it's the other option, is always gonna be the opposite, okay? Opposite of H0. And so whatever you put in H0 with the word not, okay? So my H1 is actually going to be that the die is not fair, okay? So that is a cool way to sort of remember what to put in H0, what to put in H1. One of them has to have the word not, okay? And everything else is the same, okay? So I'm just going to put that for H0, that the die is fair. For H H1, that the die is not fair. That is for part A. For part B, we need to write down the degrees of freedom. Okay, degrees of freedom, what the hell is this? And so degrees of freedom, which actually, I'm not sure if it's in your formula booklet, Probably not. It's not in your formula booklet. Wow, that's mean. Okay, this is the kind of thing. This is this is the part of the IB I don't really like. You need to memorize this, okay? It's one of the few things you actually have to memorize. So degrees of freedom. Um intuitive I'm just gonna share the intuitive idea. Okay, so intuitively it's gonna be it's sort of like rows minus one times columns minus one, okay? Just stick to that and you're gonna be fine. This is gonna be your degrees of freedom. On a more technical level, it helps to know how to carry out your chi-squared test, okay? I'm not gonna dig into that because you're probably not interested in that, okay? But intuitively, your degrees of freedom is gonna be your rows minus one times columns minus one. So how many rows do I have? I have two. Minus one. How many columns do I have? I have one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. So that means I have six columns minus one. That means I have two minus one is one. Six minus one is five. One times five is going to be five. So degrees of freedom is going to be five. That is part B. Part C. Write down the expected frequency of rolling a one. Okay. So here there is a difference we need to learn. We have expected frequency here and we have observed frequency here okay and so if this excited die is a hundred percent fair and you are in a perfect world that means the amount of times you rolled one two three four five six is always going in this scenario okay is this scenario is going to be 10 10 10 10 10 and 10 
I'm going to tell you in a second how I found it. Okay. And so this has to do with the following. A six-sided die. See, let's talk about probabilities for a second. I know you guys don't like probabilities, but deal with me. Okay. So you have, uh, okay, so there's going to be number of number on die. And down here is going to be probability. Okay. So number and die, we have one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. So if this is a die and it's a normal die and it's a fair die, what is the probability of rolling a one? Well, a die has six sides, see? And so one of the sides is one of the sides and there are six others. So the probability of rolling a one is one over six. The probability of rolling a two is also one over six because it is just an additional side of the die, see? And so you actually do the probability of one over six for all of these, okay? All right, so that is the probabilities sort of side of this whole thing, see? Over here on the right in red, I forgot to write, sorry. In red, we also have number on die, okay? Number on die, and down here we have expected, okay? So how did it reach 10? Well, the expected has to do with the amount of times you do your trial. So, my guy Leo, okay, and my guy Leo, how many times did he roll the dice? He rolled it 60 times. And so, what did what is the expected amount that I get for a 1, for rolling a 1, cierto, of those 60 times? Well, the probability of that is 1 over 6. So, I'm going to take 60, multiply by 1 over 6, and this will give me 10. You can trust me on that, or you can double check with your calculator. 10 times 1 divided by 6 will effectively give you 10. Okay, so that is expected probability. I do the same for the rest of them. This is my expected table. See, this is all just doing 1 over 6 times 60. That is how I reached that. See? Awesome. Cool. So the expected frequency of rolling a 1 is just going to be... 10. Um, I guess my answer is over here. It's going to be 10. Now we get to the juicy part. See, now we get to the part where we say find a p value for the test. God dang. All right, well, now we got to do the, the, the hardcore stuff, you know? All right, so which test? I know it might sound kind of duh, but which test? Let me just. Right, C over here. It's a little bit of a talk I have. This has to be C. Down here. Okay, so C is up there. <laughs> now for part D. Find a p-value of the test. So, first thing you need to ask yourself is which test? Then you need to say, what do I need? And then you just fucking do it, okay? So, which test is it? Here it says that Leo carries out a chi-square goodness of fit test. See? Now that tells me more than what you think. It's chi-squared goodness, goodness gracious, goodness of fit. What do I need? We're about to find out, and then we need to do it. See? So it's a chi-square goodness of, goodness of fit test. So I put up my calculator. See? I go to my testing area, which is going to be stat. At least for the TI-84, it's going to be stat and tests. Here are a shit ton of tests. Find the chi-squared one. Go all the way down, and here it is. So here we have chi-squared and chi goff Which of the two might it be? Ah, well, it literally says that we are doing a goodness of fit. G-O-F. Here we pick the goff one. Then we see that we need observed and expected, L1, L2. So what do I need? I need L1, I need L2, and my DF, see? All right, so, well, the DF is already on five. This could have been three, okay? So I should always put the correct DF. In this case, it's five. How do I know? I know from part B. All right, cool. So there I got my DF, see? Awesome. So we are good there. Now I need L1 and L2. How do I find L1 and L2? Go to stat and edit. Okay, this is the kind of thing you have to memorize. You go to stat and edit. Here are my lists. L1 and L2 are up here. See? 
One of them is observed, the other one, the other one is expected. Which one was which? We go back because our memory is fragile. L1 is observed, L2 is expected. Okay, here is my observed list. So this is going to be L1. And up here from part C is my expected one. And that is going to be me. Blah, 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 blah. That is going to be my. <laughs> that is going to be my expected list. Okay, the one on the bottom, the one that is a bunch of tens. So I'm going to put that in my calculator. See, stat edit. I erase my old lists. So I clear it up here. I clear it up here. Yapo. L1 has to be eight, seven, six, fifteen, twelve, and twelve. Take a second, double check. Looks beautiful, just like you today. L2 is going to be 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10. Great anime. Go Naruto. All right. And now we got to, well, now that we did L1, now that we did L2, and we have the F, now we need to do the test. All right, cool. Stat, test, chi squared golf. Bada bim, bada boom. Everything is correct. Calculate. Let's go. There we go. All right. So, what the hell is going on? What did this give me? Well, it gave me my chi-squared value. Okay. So, I know that my chi-squared is going to be 6.2. Uh, my p-value is going to be 0 0.287. 241. Okay. And my df, as I mentioned earlier, not really necessary that I write it. It's going to be 5. And then there's CN, TRB, just don't worry about that, okay? This is all you will probably ever, ever need. All right, so write down the p-value for the test. Well, the p-value for the test, as we just found, is this guy here. And since we like significant figures, it's going to be 0 0.287. You can write down the whole number, it's fine, see? How do significant figures work? Well, I go to 1, 2, and 3. I compare the this one to the one on the right. Since it's four or lower, that means I keep it at the, at the number that it is. I end up with this, okay? Cool. 0 0.287, 0 0.287, cool. So, yeah, well, part D is gonna be 0 0.287, or if you want the long, long version, it's gonna be the long, long number we just found. A blah, blah, blah. All right, cool. Part E, state the conclusion of the test, give a reason for your answer. So, notice this. There are two points here, see? Small detail, but there are two points here. One of them is the conclusion of my test. One of them is the reason for your answer, okay? That means you can conclude it incorrectly, but still give a reason and get half a point, or at least one point, see? Or you can, you know, do the whole process wrong, but conclude correctly and still get a point, okay? So even if the numbers don't make sense to you, with the process that you're doing. If you conclude correctly, you can get a point, okay? You can get the whole IB answer, I mean, your whole IB test pretty much wrong, but if you follow the process, they're gonna give you points for process and you end up with at least a four or a five, okay? I'm exaggerating. You're not gonna get the whole test wrong, but I am pointing out that the process matters a lot, okay? So do the conclusion with whatever your hypotheses were from part A and trust yourself and trust the process, okay? You're, you're going to get a point for it at the very least. All right, so state the conclusion of the test. How do I conclude this? Well, a good rule of thumb, okay, is that you need to compare the significance level to your p-value, see? And so it all depends on, I'm going to do this over here, see? It all depends on whether your p-value is greater than your percent of uh, your percent significance level it also had it also matters if this instead of significance level is a critical value okay all of that shit matters see in this case if my p-value is greater than my significance level um this means that we how do i say it i'm just gonna write it out okay this means that we have insufficient evidence to reject the null hypothesis. And so all you're really doing is seeing whether you reject 
or approve the null hypothesis, see? And so if my p-value is greater than my percent significance level, that means that we have insufficient evidence to reject the null hypothesis, all right? And so what is my p-value? Well, my p-value we said was 0 0.287. And is this greater than or less than my significance level? My significance level we said was 5%, which means this two, uh, this 0.287 is greater than 0 0.05. So effectively, we have insufficient evidence to reject the null hypothesis, see? Um, for concluding this kind of stuff, see? This is my conclusion, okay? And this is my reason down here, see? And that's it, all right? That, that is that is number seven, all right? I will say though, for the null hypothesis, for concluding on all that good stuff, I recommend you memorize some of this stuff. See, like if you memorize this, the day you get the opposite scenario, you just flip it, cierto? Instead of putting reject, you put approve, cierto? Or you say that there is sufficient, see? But again, Unfortunately, this is the sort of thing you do have to memorize. And the other thing that some of you are probably thinking of is why the hell is this 0.05, okay? Well, quick class. If this, sorry, for percents, okay? Mm, remember this, one is 100%. 0.05 is 50%. 0 0.05, is 5%. Okay, if you remember these three values, you can figure out any percent immediately. In fact, if I right now tell you what is in percent 0 0.287, you can, maybe you take a minute, but you will tell me that it's 28.7%. All right, so yeah, to make these comparable, you know, the p-value was in decimals, see? Gotta convert it to percent or convert this percent to a decimal which is what we did, all right? Whatever you do, this is how you approach the problem. Protocol matters a lot. Notice the context of the problem. The small word goodness of fit goes a long way to figure out which one you need to do. Yeah, whatever, man. That's number seven. Uh, I hope it helped.